Um, yeah, and with that, uh, let's begin. Again, thank you and welcome to the Tufts Pre-Law Orientation. Okay. So introduction. Um, my name is Doby King. I'm the Pre-Law Advisor at Tufts. I'm new uh, to the Career Center. Um, so I just wanted to let you know that I am an attorney. I am licensed um, here in the state of Massachusetts and formerly in New York and California. Um, I have over 20 years of legal experience as an attorney. And part of that experience involves advising students um, who are in law school or who are thinking about careers in the law. So this is definitely a passion of mine and I really look forward to getting to know each of you and to help you on your particular journey. So I do have an open door policy. Uh, if you have a question, you feel free to email me. My email is on the screen, uh, dovey.king at tufts.edu. Um, but most of you will probably want to meet with me one-on-one. -on -one. So you can do that by going to Handshake and just booking an appointment. Um, there should be a new batch of appointments available. Um, if you have a pressing issue or a deadline that's coming up and you don't see an appointment slot, feel free to email me and I'll see what I can do in terms of fitting you into my schedule. And as I'm speaking, if, if anything comes to mind or you have any questions, feel free to add them to the chat um, and hopefully we'll get to those shortly. Okay, so let's uh, move on. Yeah, so I wanted you to know what services we offer uh, with the pre-law advising program. So you all should know uh, I do offer individual advising. So again, on Handshake, you can either uh, request to meet with me for 15 minutes if you have just a general question or a quick question. And I also offer longer 30 minute appointments. Um, the longer appointments, I would encourage you if you're actually like currently applying to law school um, or maybe have a deadline, uh, those longer appointments would be to get into more substantive issues. So hopefully a lot of your general questions will be answered just from attending today's program. Um, and, and additionally, we do offer walk-in hours during Career Lab at the Career Center, and that's a faster way to get assistance. For example, if you just want someone to look over your resume or maybe have a general question about internships. Okay, um, the pre-law orientation is another service. So this is the first pre-law orientation, and so I'm so happy that you're all part of it. Um, I plan to do this regularly um, and to update, give you any updates um, or changes that you should be aware of. So um, look out for this in the future. Uh, it's a good idea, um, you know, when it's offered again, maybe next spring um, to join in just to see if there's any updates or developments. Um, and some of you don't know that I actually, like our help extends beyond Tufts. So we do work with alumni who are interested in applying to law school. Um, in fact, a good portion of my individual appointments are with alumni. And uh, just looking at the statistics for Tufts, uh, most graduates wait a few years before applying to law school. So whether you apply straight out of law, uh, college or um, you know, get some experience and get some work experience beforehand, it's going to vary depending on your individual situation. Um, but you are able to book an appointment with me a year or two down the line after graduating if you want specific help. Um, then also uh, we offer online resources. Uh, if you haven't already checked the pre-law section on the Career Center website, I would encourage you to do that because we do have some really up-to-date current resources. And I think that probably a lot of your general questions would be answered just by checking those out. Um, by the way, if there are topics that you would like to see covered on online, uh, feel free to email your ideas um, and maybe that's an issue or an area that we will develop and include in our 
website. Uh, we also offer panels and speakers throughout the year. I highly recommend that you mark your calendars for those events because this is a good opportunity for you to meet lawyers and judges and others working in the legal profession, um, particularly those who've graduated from Tufts. So just as a plug, uh, tomorrow night, March 10th at 6 p.m., the Tufts Lawyers Association is hosting its annual law day. Um, it starts at six, if there's still time to register, you can just go to their website, Tufts Lawyers Association, um, and sign up for that. Uh, I, I think that it would be very valuable for you to start talking to attorneys, especially those who are eager to mentor you and answer your questions, um, and to help out someone who also is at Tufts. So uh, that's one opportunity that's coming up. And then finally, um, we have a newsletter. So the newsletter, uh, one went out in January, another one in February. You should expect one in early April. Uh, this is where we post different opportunities in the law. It could be internships, panel discussions, uh, scholarships, uh, summer programs. Uh, please go to the pre-law section of the Career Center's website and register for that today if you haven't already, uh, because I don't want you missing out on really valuable information um, that could be useful. So this is kind of a, just a general overview of the types of services we offer. Um, yeah, so let's move on. Okay, so I get asked a lot about pre-law major. So this is where I'll, I will invite you to share on the chat. Um, about is there a pre-law major? Some of you may know. <laughs> Tufts does not have a pre-law major. Um, in fact, the vast majority of liberal arts colleges do not have a pre-law major and that's because there is no pre-law prerequisite um, for applying to law school. So what I do want you to know is that at Tufts, you have quite a few majors and minors to choose from. It's about 150. There's also a multitude of graduate programs and professional schools, and of course, thousands of courses to choose from. So uh, don't worry about the fact that there is no pre-law major. It's not something that's actually standard um, in terms of going to law school. You can basically major in any subject um, and be a good candidate for law school. Having said that, some of you may want to uh, take some classes that uh, have a legal focus while you are at Tufts. I would recommend doing this if you have an interest in the subject matter and, you know, it could give you a good basis uh, for whether or not you like that topic or just an intro to law, but don't feel um, that you have to take any of these courses as a prerequisite for law school, because as I mentioned, there aren't any prerequisites. So, but I did want to give you a few samples. So I just went on the course catalog, and these are some of the courses that are routinely offered. And you just have to check each semester. Um, like for example, Logic is a pretty popular one that can actually help you with the LSAT. And I believe that's offered in the philosophy department. Some of these are offered in political science or environmental studies. Um, you see that there's Islamic law, that seems really interesting and immigration law and policy. So uh, the bottom line is that if you do want to get some coursework and some exposure to legal classes, you have that opportunity at Tufts. And this is just a small subsection of the number of courses that are actually offered. But again, only take these classes if you feel a genuine interest and passion and curiosity for doing it. Uh, there's no benefit in taking these courses just because you think it will be advantageous for law school because as I said, there's really no prerequisite. Um, and so 
you really should be focusing on classes that you want to take um, and that you're interested in. Okay, so I get asked this question pretty frequently is what major should I, like, and what major should I choose and will it give me an advantage in applying to law school? Um, so I, I did want to highlight that there are some pretty common pathways to law school. So students who are majoring in political science or psychology, history, international relations, philosophy, English, economics, sociology, for example, those are pretty popular majors um, for students who then go on and attend law school. Um, I don't think there's any surprise there. You may not fit into any one of these categories and that's okay. And the reason is that you can still go to law school through other pathways. For example, I'm not making this up. These are actual tough students who went on to law school and majored in dance, computer science, environmental studies, engineering, Arabic, biology, theater, art history, um, and I would include in there chemistry, biology, mathematics. Uh, so the point here being that if you don't fit into kind of what the mainstream um, majors are, that's perfectly okay, that you can still be a great candidate for law school. So I wouldn't fixate on that at all. Um, it's okay. Um, actually, I, you know, I had a student I worked at Harvard Law School um, advising law students, and I frequently had students who were artists who had a background in theater, and they made it into Harvard Law School. So you can do it too, um, and don't worry too much about what your actual major is. Okay, but I don't want you to believe me just because I'm saying it. Let's look at the data. So you can actually look at um, statistics. These are available publicly online at Tufts. And I went ahead and I just looked, I was curious and I looked, you know, the past two, three years, where have our Tufts graduates gone to law school? So you'll find this really interesting because for example, uh, we had a graduate who majored in cognitive and brain sciences and that person enrolled at Boston College School of Law. Uh, we had an anthropology major who went to UCLA, uh, and uh, let's see, we had a mathematics major at Cornell, um, and even someone who studied uh, child study and human development at Boston University. So these are actual concrete cases of students at Tufts who graduated and went on to law school. So what is the takeaway? These are various law schools um, that Tufts graduates have attended. Um, if you look at these closely, chances are that you might be interested in one or more of these law schools, and they are spread out throughout the US. So, uh, you know, Harvard is there, Northeastern, which is my alma mater, Duke, Miami, UCLA, Berkeley, Stanford, Columbia. Um, so these are actual schools where Tufts students have gone on. So, um, yeah, so this, you could be highly competitive, um, for getting into one of these schools or maybe even one that's not on this list. Um, if you have questions, please keep posting those in the chat and we'll get to those. Okay. So what is the big takeaway from this? Okay. You really should be focusing on choosing a major that you genuinely like. Uh, I wouldn't recommend choosing a major based solely on what you think will increase your chances for getting into law school. Um, really what's going to help to get into law school is for you to study something that interests you to get good grades. So um, you definitely should take classes that interest you, get good grades and I, that's not to say that you shouldn't venture out to other areas um, or approach your studies in an interdisciplinary way so that you get broader 
um, information and exposure. But in general, be true to yourself, be authentic, and choose a major based on what interests you. And you can come speak with me. We can have an individual meeting and we can talk about how you too can be a great candidate for law school. Okay, so let's move on. Okay, so the things, the kind of skills that will actually help you to be successful in law school are pretty, are pretty clear. Um, communication skills. So having oral advocacy skills uh, really helpful. Um, if you're taking classes where you are giving oral presentations or maybe you're in, involved in a club where you debate or you know, use communication skills, those are definitely uh, valuable in terms of doing well in law school. If you're someone who hasn't developed your communication skills, that's okay. You, you can always develop those elsewhere, or maybe you can think of taking classes where you might be able to develop that. Um, critical thinking and analysis, uh, that's probably, I would say, the top skill um, that makes a successful lawyer. And I assume that most of you are developing um, that skill just by virtue of being a student at Tufts. So if you're taking classes where you're doing analysis, maybe you're doing research and writing, um, those are all great things that will help you as a lawyer down the line. Um, and then finally, organization. Um, again, you don't need to check all of these boxes. This isn't going to determine whether you're a great lawyer down the line, but these are just things you should think about as skills you wanna practice honing um, because they will in the long run help you out as a law student down the line. So, okay. This is probably the number one question I get asked by students is what is the timeline like I need to figure out how to plan my life and you know I don't want to miss any deadlines for law school um, and the fact is that this timeline is highly personalized to you given what your situation is what your interests are you know what your goals are so I have posted a timeline um, for you to view uh, just as a general guideline in the pre-law page. Um, but really what I want you to take from this is that, you know, your first and second year in college, obviously you should be um, figuring out what you want to do, what major you, you want to have. Um, and really your third year in college, if you're planning on applying to law school straight from college, this is the year uh, especially in the spring of your junior year, where you need to kind of buckle down and get things together. Um, if you're a junior now and you're thinking about applying and you haven't done any of this stuff, it's okay. You can still meet with me and we can still do some planning in advance um, to make sure that, that you can meet your goals. Um, and finally, your, your senior year, um, you know, that's, really when you're going to be sending applications to law school. So take from this, uh, you know, this is not a cookie cutter. It's not going to fit everybody's situation. Most people want to take some time off to do a fellowship, to do work, et cetera. However, for those of you who do want to apply to law school um, straight from college, you're spring semester junior year is going to be an important time for you um, so just kind of put that in your mind and make a note of that and uh, I'll talk to you more about that later okay so I also get asked a lot like this is overwhelming I have no idea what the law school application is like and what I tell people is that it's not that different from your application to college or to Tufts. Um, you know, there's similar things that you will have to gather 
um, in order to submit an application. Um, hold on one second. One of the important things is your LSAT score. So most um, law schools require you to sit for the LSAT and um, you know, report a score. Um, there are some schools that don't necessarily require the LSAT. The one that comes to mind is Harvard, um, which gives you the option of taking the GRE or the LSAT. But just be aware that the vast majority of law schools will require the LSAT. The good news about the LSAT is that, you know, they have a really great website. You can log in and you can predict what months of every year they offer it. So you can kind of plan ahead knowing that it's offered like January, February, April, June, August, etc. cetera. Um, so you can plan ahead and I would recommend that you also look at the fees associated with taking the test. Um, and if you want to give yourself time to possibly take it a second or even a third time to improve your score, you want to factor all that into your timeline so that you have your score available and ready to report um, for your law school application. But again, you can meet with me individually. We can discuss that and see what that looks like for your situation. So um, I'm not going to go into the LSAT very much, you can go online and um, you can get free tests to kind of get a sense of what's tested. You know, there's some multiple choice questions, some logic questions, there's a written portion, um, but you can easily access that sort of information if you go to the LSAT website. Um, so the other thing is, you know, similar to your Tufts application, you're gonna have letters of recommendation, um, your transcript, a resume may not be required by all law schools, but if you are able to submit it, it could be something that enhances your application. So I would highly encourage you to keep your resume up to date. Uh, there's a, a certain format for your resume that would resonate best for law schools, and I'm happy to talk to you about that in individual meetings. Um, but just keep in mind, you this is not rocket science. You've done this before. You just need to make your checklist. That you're gonna need letters, transcript, resume, get the application in advance. And then probably what most people find the most challenging or maybe tedious is the personal statement um, for your law school application. Um, some of you, may find it advantageous to have a supplemental statement called the diversity statement. You know, unfortunately, the legal profession is still very much um, dominated by white males. Um, and I think it's something like currently about 89%. Um, so there, it's one of the least diverse professions. So if you can show in your application how you will add to the diversity of the legal profession, whether it's in terms of your gender, your ethnicity, your interest areas, a diversity statement might be beneficial for you. And that's something that most schools will allow you to include as a supplemental essay. Um, and also keep in mind um, that there is typically uh, space to talk about special circumstances. So this is where you could make a statement. For example, you know, if your grades aren't, you don't feel they're truly reflective of your potential, um, you could write, you know, things happen in life. Some of you have been dealing, you know, with COVID, with loss and grief and other, you know, medical issues, et cetera. Um, so I would recommend if you have any of those situations that you meet with me, and then I can kind of advise you how you might be able to address that so that it's not a ding on your application um, and that you can explain it. Um, finally, there is this thing called character and fitness. So in order to become a licensed attorney, and like I mentioned before, I went for California, New York, and Massachusetts. The only way that you can get licensed is if you pass this character and fitness test. 
So this means that law schools are going to be asking you questions about, you know, maybe past convictions or, you know, things of that nature that may complicate um, your ability to be uh, become a licensed attorney. Again, this is a very case-by-case -case situation. It's very personal. Um, I'm happy to discuss with you, you know, if there's any issues of concern for you. Um, yeah, but this, just be aware going into law school that that's a hurdle that you'll have to overcome in terms of showing your um, character and fitness. Okay. Okay, so this is, <laughs> This is a fun exercise for me. So your personal statement. We've come a long way in terms of what kind of personal statement resonate most um, at a law school and really showcase your skills, your talents, you know, your reasons for wanting to attend law school. But let's go back to 1935 and see what a personal statement might have looked like then. So the question on the application is why do you want to why do you wish to come to Harvard? And this is a real personal statement and I'll read it. The reasons that I have for wishing to go to Harvard are several. I feel that Harvard can give me a better background and a better liberal education than any other university. I have always wanted to go there as I have felt that it's not just another college but it's a university with something definite to offer. Then too, I would like to go to the same college as my father. To be a Harvard man is an enviable distinction and one that I sincerely hope I shall attain. And this is literally the entire personal statement. So I just wanted to ask you, who, who wrote this personal statement? Think of a historical figure who went to Harvard and Harvard Law School, any ideas? And Matt, feel free to share people's guesses here. Who wrote this personal statement? Any guesses out there? One guess was JFK. Okay. Any others? Uh, another was Obama. Okay. <laughs> These are good guesses. Anything else? Okay, so <laughs> you were correct. This was uh, President John F. Kennedy. This was his college um, admissions personal statement. Uh, how many sentences is that? Like one, two, like six, seven sentences, and he clearly got in. So, but things have changed. You really want to put in some time and energy into your personal statements. And so when you're at the point of actually applying to law school, I'm very happy to help you um, in developing that and kind of helping you find your narrative um, that will um, enhance your application and maximize your chances of getting it. Okay, so beyond classes uh, that you can take to help you uh, get exposure to the law. These are other important things I want you to consider. Extracurricular activities can be really important and can enhance your application. At Tufts, there's a ton of different organizations you can be a part of, but I want you to know that there are certain organizations that um, kind of overlap with law. Um, there's the Pre-Law Society. I would highly encourage you to look into joining that. There's a lot of benefits and information that you can get from being a member and programs. Um, and I would love to, if there's anyone from the Pre-Law Society um, on this meeting today, I would love to speak to your group. So send me an email and hopefully we can coordinate that. The Tufts also has a mock trial team. So if you're someone who, um, wants to get into that that's available in the debate society. And, you know, I did the debate society when I was in college. It was really fun. You know, not everyone wants to do debate, but these are just some options for you to consider. 
that could enhance your resume. You could also, you know, uh, you could also meet other people with similar interests who are applying to law school, and that also could be great um, for you. In addition to those, uh, there are so many cultural or identity groups at Tufts um, where you could build leadership skills, you could do great community service, as well as political groups like, um, you know, get out the vote or political parties, et cetera. These are, these are great activities for you to be involved in um, that can really help you as a lawyer and also enhance your resume. And then finally, student government um, is another option that you have at Tufts. So if you're not already involved in student activities, I would highly recommend that you consider any one of these categories. Um, it's just a really great way to meet people, to be involved, to share your interest in the law, and then maybe learn something new that will help you on your journey uh, to law school. Additionally, um, I know some of you dread this, but networking is really important. And so let me make my pitch. Um, there are a number of resources available to you um, so that you can start mingling with lawyers and judges and people you really want to talk to, um, to mentor you, to give you information about law school and um, to help you. So currently uh, we have the herd. Um, if you haven't heard about that, that's an area where you can uh, connect with an alum and get mentorship. I would recommend that you start there. Um, LinkedIn is a great resource. I mentioned the Tufts Lawyers Association. They have a LinkedIn page. I would highly recommend that you join that page. There's a number of lawyers, judges, others who graduated from Tufts who are eager to mentor you, to help you on your path to law school, this is a great resource. Um, this is something that we can discuss in a one-on-one -on -one meeting. I can help you pair you with someone or make an introduction, but you really should be using this resource because not every university has this sort of group. And I just think it's amazing that you have access to this group of lawyers. And like I said, tomorrow night, the Tufts Lawyers Association is hosting an event. I if you're available at six o'clock, please attend, still register. Um, and the Tufts Lawyers Association has a LinkedIn page, they have a website, um, they may have a Facebook page. So there's different ways for you to connect. Um, face, Facebook is a good way to connect with lawyers. There are a number of diverse bar associations. Um, depending on what your interests are or what your cultural background is. Uh, it would, could be a really great idea for you to connect with others who have similar backgrounds. Um, and so I actually have a, more information about this on the pre-law um, page in the Career Center uh, website. And then alumni events, so obviously, mark your calendars for Law Day and any other panels, uh, discussions that we're offering, bringing lawyers together. So it's, these are all done to help you get more information, to feel more confident and be connected to the legal community. Okay, internships. So I get asked all the time, how important are internships? And Internships are, can be really important in a variety of ways. Um, not only can you get great experience, but it's a way to give back to the community. Uh, it's a way to build your leadership skills. It's a way to bolster your resume and to show the law school that you're someone who's really involved in community and kind of explain your interest in the law. So when you have an opportunity to do an internship, I highly recommend it. Um, there's so many great benefits. Well, how do you land an internship? So there's a number of places I would recommend that you look. Um, handshake being the number one area, employers from all sorts of backgrounds um, post positions on Handshake. 
uh, don't feel that you need to necessarily do a legal internship, doing any internship and getting experience uh, or doing community service or volunteer work, those are all spectacular as well. Um, so even if it's not a legal internship, it could really help build your skills and make yourself marketable for law school. Um, you may already know that we have a virtual career fair. Make sure that um, you don't pass that up. Check to see if there are any employers that you might be interested in. That could be a good way um, of getting a position. Um, also, Tisch Summer Fellows uh, is a popular way. Uh, it can be competitive, but I look that up in advance and see if that might be a good fit for you to connect um, with an internship. I, I personally like LinkedIn jobs. I think it's highly useful um, in terms of legal positions. Um, and I think it's, you know, in some ways better than other areas. So don't, don't um, you know, underestimate LinkedIn. Um, you can meet with me and I can show you how to maximize that. But I think it's a really great resource for identifying either postgraduate jobs or internships while you're a student. And um, hopefully a lot of you know about idealist.org. Um, it's really kind of a nonprofit social justice type of um, employer job bank. And they have specific listings for legal employers as well as for a wide variety of other issues like, like health, um, you know, health, uh, just everything under the sun. Um, so if you're interested generally in nonprofit work and kind of social justice work, legal work, Idealist is a really great resource for identifying a job or an internship. Um, and then finally, diversity pipeline programs are programs that are offered um, typically through a law school in the summer. Um, these are free programs where you can apply to participate and you would get kind of a law school experience in like a couple of weeks. Um, so for example, this summer, there's a local law school in Boston called Suffolk um, and they're offering a two week uh, diversity pipeline program. So if you're um, spending your summer in Boston and you wanted to get some experience you know, to see what law school might be like, you could apply to that program, attend for free. It's a two week program. You'd meet lawyers, you'd meet professors, you'd, you'd attend classes that are typical like law school classes. So you can kind of get a sense of what it's like. And they actually also um, can help you with your law school applications. And sometimes they can offer financial assistance um, for taking the LSAT uh, or applying to law school. So I did mention the Suffolk Pipeline Program in the February newsletter. So if you didn't subscribe to the newsletter, you can either Google it or you can check out the February newsletter and get some more information. Um, the Suffolk Program is only one of several offered throughout the US and a lot of them are done remotely. So um, the one at Suffolk happens to be in person, um, but not all of them require in-person attendance. So I hope you're asking lots of questions because we're gonna have time um, in a few minutes um, to answer them. So I one thing that's important to me is diversity in the legal profession. And I want you to understand that law is for everyone. So we may get a certain perspective of what it means to be a lawyer, just based on media and TV and movies and that sort of thing. But the fact of the matter is that there are incredible people from incredibly diverse backgrounds, cultures, religions, et cetera, doing incredible work in the law. So the next few slides are, are going to be devoted to that. So um, as I mentioned, in terms of diversity, uh, a lot has been done in the last decade um, to try to increase diversity in the legal profession. Um, there are a number of national lawyer associations and law student associations um, that you can be a part of 
um, if you identify in any one of these categories. This is just an example, but for example, there's a National LGBTQ Bar Association. The Dream Bar Association, um, which is one of my favorite organizations, is an association that brings together undocumented students and lawyers. Um, you know, there's a misconception that if you don't have legal status, you can't be a lawyer, but that's not true. You actually can um, go to law school and get licensed to practice law. It's a little bit trickier, um, and I would definitely want you to meet with me um, for some guidance. Um, but that's what the Dream Bar Association is. And you can see there's one for disabled people, for you know, black students, Hispanic women, Asian, South Asian, etc. If you want a more comprehensive list of all these different organizations, you just go to the pre-law um, page um, at Tufts. Um, the point here being that you can be part of a community um, that you identify with, um, that could be supportive to you. Um, yeah, it could be a really great resource. And you know, we need to start moving away from this vision that law is you know, the stereotype block. Any of you can add diversity, can add great things to the legal profession. Um, and there's communities out there who would gladly welcome you. Okay, so it's about 12.45. So I also wanted to show you, um, some people ask me what, like, what are like the pressing issues right now in the law? If there's been so much change in the past couple of years, especially with, you know, racial justice and community policing. You know, if you wanna type your ideas, like what you think, um, share in the chat, what are some cutting edge pressing legal issues like in the here and the now. Um, the law is a constantly evolving area. And so um, the legal issues and uh, it will change um, depending on the times, and on society. Um, so if anyone is sharing any ideas, Matt, I'm happy to entertain them. And I have some ideas also about what are some, kind of some pressing issues um, that we've seen lately. Yeah, one of our uh, tenants um, you know, mentioned trans rights as, as a, certainly a, a, another pressing legal issue in the modern, in the modern age. Yeah, that's a good one. So I, I just put a list of kind of some major ones and guess what the first one is. So trans rights is, is a, a, a big issue right now, both in terms of, um, you know, interest groups trying to limit the rights of transgender people and also on the other side, expanding the rights of transgender individuals, especially in the workplace and in public accommodations. Some other issues, reproductive rights and freedoms, you know, there are several states um, are attacking Roe v. Wade and a woman's right to choose. That's kind of a hot issue right now. Racial profiling, voting rights, clearly one of uh, several states are changing their laws to kind of a limit who has access to the vote in the poll. And this is a serious issue. And that's something that you probably see in the news these days. Um, national security is still a big one. Immigrants' rights. Um, you know, we all know what's going on in the Ukraine right now um, and the violence and the Russian occupation. And uh, just recently, a couple of days ago, um, uh, we announced that Ukraine citizens who are already in the U.S. will have a temporary protected status um, because, which will help them against being deported because clearly they can't be deported back to a country in turmoil um, where there's violence. So, you know, that's always evolving environmental issues, death penalty, international human rights, women's issues and equal pay. 
So um, those are just a few examples. So my point in sharing this with you is just to let you know that beyond kind of the mainstream areas in law, like corporate law, employment law, um, securities, patent law, um, you know, kind of those mainstream, more conservative areas, if you don't fit into that category of wanting to go to a big firm, there's still a place for you as a lawyer to do really interesting, exciting work that has social impact. Um, so that's really what I want you to see just by sharing these issues with you. So I'm going to conclude my presentation um, just by talking about Jumbo because Jumbo is our mascot at Tufts. And I thought this is a good illustration of how law is constantly evolving and how it's very dynamic and you could be someone who really shapes the future of the law um, in a certain direction. So let's, let's look at Jumbo's journey. So we all know that Jumbo was added to the greatest show on earth in 1882 by Kitty Barnum. Well, what happened with Jumbo? Attitudes about circus elephants have actually evolved quite a bit over time since 1882. Um, in fact, in the 1970s, there was this growing movement called the Animal Rights Movement um, and this new area of, all, of law called animal law emerged during that time. So let's fast forward to 2017. Um, I saw a case here in Massachusetts in the city of New Bedford where a case was brought um, to protect zoo elephants at the town zoo. Um, and so the lawsuit raised violations to the Endangered Species Act, which is a federal law um, alleging cruelty against zoo elephants. Um, and currently 13 cities in Massachusetts, they ban or they restrict using circus animals. Um, so you can't hold a, a circus in those areas um, if you have um, you know, live animals. And then there's actually a bill um, in state legislature that would prohibit exotic animals in traveling shows. So from 1882 to the present, there's been a, quite a bit of change um, in societal attitudes um, and feelings about using live animals in circus, circuses. Uh, there's a lot of legal buzz in this area. And I just want you to know that as future lawyers, you too have a voice in shaping the legal profession and pushing certain issues. It's a really dynamic, interesting area um, to build a career. So I applaud all of you for actually considering it. I've had a wonderful career as an attorney and I'm happy to talk with you individually how you too can have a really satisfying career in the law, uh, whatever your interests are. So that, yep, currently now animal law is taught in over 80 law schools, including Harvard, Georgetown, Stanford, and NYU. So we've come a really long way in the jumbo journey. Um, and with that, I just want to conclude my presentation and thank you for joining. Uh, we have about 10 minutes for questions. If any of you want to stick around, um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dewey. That's an amazing presentation and a wealth of information. And I think our tough students are certainly grateful for, for the amazing insights and all the possibilities that they have with our careers. Um, no questions as of yet. Okay. Uh, that's perfect. So what I would encourage you to do, having attended this session, is if if you want to book an appointment to talk with me one-on-one, -on -one, please go to Handshake and find a spot that works for you um, or email me um, if you have some sort of pressing deadline and I'll try to work around your schedule. Hey, Dovey, we do have one question. Sure. Someone was asking, uh, 
Can you speak a little bit more about the process of actually choosing which law schools to apply to? How is it similar, different to the college choice process in terms of when the process you should start looking, number of schools you apply to, going on tour visits, et cetera? Okay, so how do, you, how do you plan and manage that? That's a really great question. Thank you for that. So, um, so this is going to be highly individualized based on you. So one thing that I, I discuss with students is where do you see yourself? Where do you want to be geographically? Um, it's very different if you want to be in a major city and attend law school versus being more open to kind of like, you know, kind of Midwest or kind of in between the two coasts. Um, there's also a number of things that you should be considering in law school beyond just the ranking of the law school. Um, and it really depends on the things that are important to you. Um, but some students tell me that diversity is really important and that's something that you can research in law schools. How diverse is it in terms of male, female, in terms of you know, people of color? Uh, you may wanna look at faculty um, along those lines as well. And if there's a particular area of law that you're drawn to, it would be great to also research which law schools um, have good programs in that area. So just as you did that with Tufts, you know, there may be one school that has a great health law um, program or another one that really specializes in immigration law. So I can kind of walk you through that and, and we could come up with the list. Um, another useful tool is if you go to the LSAT website, you can punch in your GPA and your LSAT score and it would auto-generate a, a long list of schools that you would be highly competitive for. I think that's useful because it may open your eyes to some schools that you may not have thought about that could possibly be a really good fit for you. So I, I strongly encourage you to, to look beyond just rankings. Um, you know, obviously get into the best school that you can get into that is, is good, but for you to be successful, for you to thrive, um, there's other considerations that I think would be important as well. So I can I am happy to meet with you one on one to discuss your situation. Oh, that's great. We have another question too. Um, one is about law school admission interviews. Are they always required? So that's going to vary from school to school. Um, if you have the opportunity to either attend an admissions event um, or to interview, I highly recommend it. Um, you know, this is an opportunity for you just to make a personal connection, to ask questions, um, to really express your interest in the law. Um, and for those of you who are, um, who are having interviews, I can also help prep you um, depending on what school that is, so that you can be very active and very um, focused um, in what you want to do. So that really will depend school by school. Uh, there's a lot of schools that don't require that at all. So uh, yeah, it depends. There are resources when the volume of application costs and fees and LSAT tests and variety, are there in your experience resources that are available to students to provide subsistence or support or financial um, uh, supplemental support for students as they're applying for schools? Um, another great question. So, uh, you know, when I was applying to law school, you know, my family had very limited resources, as did I, and, and I applied for fee waivers. Um, those are still available for law school applications or even the LSAT. Um, you might be able to get the LSAT fee waived or reduced, um, and you may also be able to tap into funds that will help defray the cost of the test or of your law school applications. Um, so it's going to vary by school, but that's another area where I'm happy to guide you. Um, but just keep in mind that it, these pipeline programs also that I mentioned before, um, one of the benefits is or perks is that they may offer financial assistance to cover your LSAT 
fees um, and application fees. Um, but I'm, I'm happy to work with you individually to kind of see what your situation is. And that's something you can kind of plan ahead. Um, and there's an, a number of scholarships also um, that are available regardless of your immigration status. Um, and, you know, we have that information at the Career Center and I'm happy to share that with you. By the way, I, just one thing I want to mention is that um, it, there are testing accommodations available for the LSAT. And I think it's really important to keep in mind if you are a student who needs an accommodation, um, I've helped several people request that. And you know, you want to get the best LSAT score that you can. So if you're able to explain uh, the basis for your, like typically it's a disability accommodation, um, that's something that you can request. So that either you have extra time or you have certain testing uh, accommodations um, so that you're able to truly reflect what you're capable of with an accommodation. We have a couple of minutes left. So if there's any final question. We have one more right now. It says, you know, we are thinking about a gap year between maybe undergraduate and graduate. You know, do you have thoughts or recommendations of how somebody might might spend their time that could be advantageous to their law school applications? Yeah, so I think any experience that you can gain prior to law school could be a benefit um, because any real world experience that you have, whether it's in kind of a traditional workplace or doing some sort of volunteer work, et cetera, it helps you kind of define who you are and what you wanna do. And I think having a strong sense of self going into law school is a great asset. Um, you know, one thing that motivated me to go to law school is when I graduated from college, I worked with inner city students who were low income and just faced a whole host of challenges. And it really motivated me to want to use my law degree to help people who typically don't have access to justice um, due to financial reasons or, or due to their backgrounds or immigration status. So the more that you can go out there and get experience, um, learn how to interact with people, have a structured job, those are all things that could definitely benefit you. But again, um, if you choose not to do a gap year and go straight to call it, uh, law school, um, you know, that can also work. It really depends on you and what your individual goals are. Uh, I don't think there's any particular type of job that will be advantageous. Uh, you should choose something that you truly feel interested and drawn to. And I think that will show in your application um, that you're someone who really has a focus and pursues areas um, that resonate with you. So I think um, we're out of time and that will be our last question. Um, but I thank all of you for participating today. I hope this was helpful to you. Um, it's only one of several other uh, panels and events that we hope to offer to you. If you would like to meet with me individually, please sign on um, to Handshake. And I look forward to meeting you there. And for those of you who are attending tomorrow night's uh, Law Day, I hope to see you there. Um, yeah, it was a great meeting all of you. Thank you so much for your time. Have a great day.